Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. He had one of the coolest names in the history of sports. He was a part of the NFL's first real dynasty team. Incredibly smart, he finished high school before he was 16, ultimately joined a semi-pro team, caught the eye of Curly Lambeau, and was a member of the inaugural class of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And his high of catching 14 touchdown passes in one season is still a record for a halfback. Next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, the story of Johnny Blood. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. And today, the story of Johnny Blood, one of the coolest names in sports. A name, by the way, which he gave to himself and it stuck. Joining me in just a moment will be Ralph Hickok, author of Vagabond Halfback, the saga of Johnny Blood McNally. Hickok spent nearly three years on the road with Johnny to write his biography, but the book wasn't released until 2017 because Johnny had asked Ralph not to publish the book until after he had passed. Johnny passed in 1985. Ralph got sidetracked but finally put all of his notes together, wrote the book, and the result a wonderful look back at a very popular member of the Green Bay Packers, but a player whom the rest of football fans know very little about or even remember. So today, we're going to take a look back at the terrific and sometimes zany career of Johnny Blood. Today's show is sponsored by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Audible is a great way to enjoy your favorite books, especially when you're on the run. Give it a try free at www.audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh. I just finished listening to a terrific book about one of the greatest tennis matches ever played. And in just a few weeks, we'll be talking about one of the participants in that match and the fact that he was a hero in so many different ways. Check out Audible. It's a terrific service and it's free for 30 days. I also invite you to visit the Sports Forgotten Heroes Patreon page at patreon.com backslash sportsfh. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com backslash sportsfh. Every day there's a sports quiz, information on upcoming podcasts, historical notes about sports, the heroes we talk about, and there's a lot more coming too. It's also a great way to show your support for Sports Forgotten Heroes. Again, that's patreon.com backslash sportsfh. Follow Sports Forgotten Heroes heroes on twitter at sports f heroes look for our page on facebook or visit sports forgotten heroes on the web at sportsfh.com what a great name johnny blood you know it amazes me that this pro football hall of famer isn't as well known as one would think especially with such a name but the fact is he's not and here to talk about johnny blood is ralph hickok author of the book Vagabond Halfback, The Saga of Johnny Blood McNally. Ralph, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. So glad you could be here. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here, Juan. 
Oh, Good great. I'm, I'm so happy you're here. Hey, before we get into the story of Johnny Blood McNally, why don't you tell us a little bit about your interest in him? Okay. Uh, I, I grew up in Green Bay, and uh, my dad was a uh, news editor of the Green Bay Press-Gazette. Uh, he was also the official scorer for the Packers. Uh, and I, I'm talking about late 40s, early 50s, when uh, the Packers had pretty bad teams in that era. <laughs> And uh, starting when I was like eight years old until I went to college, I I spent just about every Packer home game in the press box helping Dad with stats and stuff. And I heard a lot of coaches and players and former coaches and players and sports writers and uh, uh, scouts and people talking about, you know, players of the past. And, uh, you know, a lot of great names in there, Herber, Hinkle, Hudson, you know, those, mentioned the three H's. Mm-hmm. And, but the name that really stood out that I kept hearing over and over was Johnny Blood. Well, with a name like Blood, I'm, I'm sure it would have to pique your interest. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he, he got his, that name in a rather unusual way, and I kind of suspect he picked it because it does stand out. You know? Sure, sure. Uh, but uh, so when, when I was like about 12 or 13, I, pr- I pretty much knew I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. And at some point I said to myself, if, if somebody else doesn't write a book about Johnny Blood, I'm going to do it. Uh-huh. And uh, so now I'm going to you know, fast forward to 1971. My, my first book was published in, 19, in November 1971. Uh, it was called Who Was Who in American Sports, uh, basically a collection of about 1,500 obituaries. Mm. Is what it mm. to. And so when when that book was published, I, I kind of figured now I've got some credentials and I can approach him. So um, I knew Lee Remmel, who was the Packer uh, Director of uh, Public Relations at the time. He had been a colleague at the Press Gazette with my dad. So I got uh, Johnny Blood's real name is John Victor McNally Jr. And uh, so I got in touch with Lee, and he gave me John's address in St. Paul, Minnesota. So I, I'm in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. So on a Tuesday in February, I, I remember it quite well, Tuesday in February of 1972, I wrote a letter to John McNally, and I told him about myself and my background, and I said I'd really like to work on a book with him, a biography. So I mailed a letter, and Sunday afternoon I get a phone call, and the voice says, this is John McNally, you know me as Johnny Blood. Wow. So of course I I was very thrilled that he called so (laughs) fast. Now I I was working at the New Bedford newspaper at the time, so then he absolutely floored me. He said, I'm parked in front of the newspaper, but it's closed on Sunday. How do I get to your house from here? Oh, wow. <laughs> so uh, so he he got to my house, and we sat down, and we kind of planned out a book right there. And then uh, wow. we spent the next, I guess, three, four, about four years, three years, meeting, you know, pretty often and uh, doing interviews and stuff. And it, it was a lot of fun. The process was fun in itself. I bet. Hey, let me ask you this. Uh, the name Blood, Johnny Blood. One might think the name has a really cool story behind it. It is pretty cool, but it's not what some people might think. How did he get the nickname Blood? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, an interesting question, Warren. He uh, he went to St. John's University, or at the time of St. John's College in Minnesota, and it was only a two-year college at the time. That that's where he first played football. He never played in high school. Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And so he spent two years playing football there. Uh, the first year was actually an intramural sport, and then it became a varsity sport. And then he he kind of said to himself, you know, I. I wonder how good I really am. You know, he had done well, but it was against, you know, low level competition. And being a Midwestern Irish Catholic, uh, he decided to go to Notre Dame and uh, try out for the football team. Of course, that was, uh, this would have been 1922, I believe. Uh And of course, that was the new Rockney era. Right. Four horsemen and so forth. Um, so now John was uh, 
he he was a halfback, but he was a pretty big guy for a halfback in those days. He was at like six one hundred and ninety pounds. And um when he showed up at the Notre Dame Trio, uh Rockney's assistant coach took one look at him and he said, uh, okay, you're uh, you're gonna be a tackle. <laughs> and John said, No, uh, a, a tackle seeks contact and a halfback avoids contact. I'd rather avoid contact, so I want to try out as a halfback. <laughs> so the coach said, okay, if you're not going to play tackle, you're not going to be on the team. So he never played for Notre Dame. Hmm. Uh, so then he, he ended up, he got thrown out of Notre Dame for a, a drunken St. Patrick's Day episode, uh, tipped over a streetcar with some other students, and uh, ended up back in, in Minneapolis, uh, working at a newspaper which his uncle owned or was publisher of. Right, right. And he decided to try out for a, a semi-pro team in Minneapolis called the East 26th Street Liberties. But he still had college eligibility remaining, and he didn't want to lose that. So, uh, you know, as often happened in those days, he, he had to play under an assumed name. Uh, so somewhere along the line, he'd acquired a motorcycle <laughs> Uh, this is now 1925, and uh, he and a college friend of his named Ralph Hansen were riding on the motorcycle to the tryout, and they went past a movie theater. And uh, the movie marquee said, uh, Rudolph Valentino in Blood and Sand. <laughs> so John, over his shoulder to Ralph Hansen, who was riding behind him, said, that's it. I'll be Johnny Blood, and you'll be Ralph Sand. And so he played in the NFL and coached for 15 years under the name of Johnny Blood, and he was always referred to Johnny Blood. And in fact, he signed that name to his contract. Wow, wow. Yeah, that's not uh, 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 what I think people would surmise in how one gets a nickname. And he gave it to himself. Quite interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, and and he, you know, when I asked him about it, I said that were were you thinking at the time that this is a really cool name that people will remember? And he said, "Well, I I don't think I was consciously thinking, but it was probably in my subconscious." So. And <laughs> hey, let me ask you this: with all the time that you spent with him, what did you find to be the most fascinating or the most surprising thing about Johnny Blood? Well, you know, one of the things I had heard about him as a kid that was that he was very highly intelligent, and um, and I was impressed with that. Uh, right, he graduated and, high school when he was just sixteen years old, but too young to attend college. Yeah, actually, he was fourteen. When oh, he, wow! When he yeah, and he spent another year at high school just like studying typing or something like that, just just because his parents didn't want him to go to college at that age. But he was an exceptionally bright guy and uh, and a very thoughtful guy. Often I would, you know, we had a lot of conversations, and often, you know, I'd bring up something, and he would just kind of contemplate it for quite a long time. Hmm. Sometimes I thought he wasn't going to answer at all, you know. But uh, he, he was just a very thoughtful guy, you know, very... And uh, and he he talked a lot about you know Moby Dick and Shakespeare and you know just all sorts of stuff it had nothing to do with football. Hmm. What but, did he but, what did what did he do between high school and the time he finally went to St. John's? What what was he doing? Well, he uh, uh, he as I said, he spent a year like doing uh, postgraduate work, I guess you'd call it, high school, and then he went to uh, actually the college that his mother had gone to. She was a, a, a teacher, had been a teacher, and she had gone to um, uh, River Falls uh, um, Normal School, as they called it at the time. So his parents kind of sent him there with the idea that maybe he'd become a teacher. And he spent like a year there uh, before he, he went on to St. John's, which was his father's alma mater. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he spent he spent two years at, at St. John's and then uh, then the year at, or a little less than a year at Notre Dame. And uh, then his family kind of didn't know what to do with him because he was obviously a very bright guy. 
uh, he was actually a, a candidate for a Rhodes Scholarship. Oh, wow. At, at one point. Um, and uh, somebody, a friend of the family, said that he, he would have won a Rhodes Scholarship, as a, except that he was still too young. Hmm. Um, that, and uh, it, it, so it, they didn't know what to do with him, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, he came from a good, you know, middle class family. His father, you know, had a good, solid job. And uh, so they kept the, for a while, they had him reading law in an uncle's law office. And then and then this other uncle took him on as a stereotyper at the uh, 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 at the Minneapolis newspaper. And so he was just kind of, you know, looking for something to do, really. And, and, and didn't he have a chance um, to become or, well... What I read was he could have chosen a career path that could have led uh, him to becoming the owner or the publisher of the Minneapolis Tribune. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that was his uncle. Uh, you know, he's, as I said, he worked as a stereotyper, but that was kind of, you know, starting at the bottom, you know, so he could move up. And at one point, his, his uncle, uh, whose name was Murphy, uh, it was his... his um, his mother's brother uh, called him into the office and he said, you know, John, if, if you work hard at it, uh, you know, and move up through the ranks, you can be publisher of this newspaper someday. And John told me he didn't, he, he just, that didn't strike him as a good idea. He didn't really respond to it. You know, he said something, oh, that's nice or something like that, but just kind of dismissed it, you know, because it didn't interest him. Hmm. So, yeah, so instead of pursuing a career in the newspaper industry, he opted to pursue a career in athletics, namely football. But yeah. before we get to football, he also wanted to try something a little different. He toyed <laughs> with boxing, didn't he? Yeah. And he thought just because he was bigger than someone else that he could beat them in the ring. Heck, he really felt he didn't have to do a whole lot of practice, a whole lot of sparring. But beating someone in the ring, that's not what happened. Tell us about a short fling with boxing. <laughs> yeah, that that was uh, interesting. I had never read about this. And, you know, I read a lot of stuff that had been written about Johnny Blood, and I had never heard about this before. Uh, but uh, we went to Minneapolis. We met a guy named Ernie Flegel, who pretty much told the story of John's boxing career. Now, Ernie Flegel was a, uh, a, a pretty highly ranked, I, th I think, a lightweight fighter uh, from Minneapolis, but he, he lost the sight in an eye in a fight, hmm. so he became a trainer. And uh, his gym was right near the newspaper in Minneapolis where, where John worked out, or where John worked. And they used to see one another all the time, didn't really know one another. Uh, but one day, John was standing outside after lunch. He was eating a candy bar, and Ernie Flegel came walking by, and John said, uh, uh, called him over and said, I, I, wanna, uh, I want you to teach me how to box. And uh, Flegel said, oh, yeah, don't be silly. You're a football player. Because people already knew that he was a pretty good football player. But the next day, Flegel's walking by again on the way to the gym, and John brought it up again. So Flegel said, okay, come on over to the gym. I'll show you a little bit. So, so as Flegel described it to me, he said, uh, uh, he said, I brought John in, and I, and I, you know, I jabbed at a punching bag. I said, this is how you hit it. And he said he, he mimicked what I did exactly. Hmm. And... Uh, and he did some more of this, you know, showing him how to how to throw a jab, how to throw a hook and stuff. And he said, like, he just uh, he just picked up, you know, all the movements. And we shouldn't be surprised at that based on the fact of how smart he was and the fact that he was a great athlete. Yeah, yeah. Well, Flegel was quite surprised anyway. So, um, so he said, uh, Flegel said, you know, if you work out with me for a few months, uh, I'll get you a fight. And John said, no, I'm not going to wait a few months. I, I, I'll work out for a week, and I want to fight uh, a guy named Anderson, who was like the, uh, he was the middleweight champion, I believe, of, of uh, <laughs> the state of Minnesota. And Flegel said, hey, that's ridiculous, you know, he's an experienced fighter. And John insisted he's going to fight this Anderson guy. 
So Flegel was also a promoter. He arranged fights every week at uh, the Gaiety Theater in Minneapolis. So he set up a fight with, between John and Anderson. As Flegel told me, he felt stupid about it. He figured everybody would be laughing at him, throwing this inexperienced guy in. And, and uh, But John went in and he, he held his own. Mm-hmm. And Flegel was, you know, yelling, keep the left up. And John kept the left up. And they, they fought three rounds and it was... Uh, it was declared a draw. Wow. And the the rule was that these, they fought, these were three-round fights, but if it was a draw after three rounds, they were supposed to fight a fourth round. So Flegel went up to John, and he said, you know, I think you beat him. Uh, do you want to go a fourth round with him? And John said, no, I, you know, I've learned what I wanted to know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm I'm happy with a draw. And Flegel said, well, okay, we'll keep working out and, you know, I'll, you can become a professional. John said, no, I'm not interested in boxing anymore. I found out what I wanted to know. So, <laughs> so that was the end of his boxing career. <laughs> yeah, he didn't like to be hit, right? He wanted to evade tacklers. <laughs> he didn't want to do the tackling. Yeah, exactly. I, I avoid contact. Yeah, yeah so, so he finishes his short-lived boxing career, decides he doesn't want to be a newspaper publisher he doesn't go to college or well he 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 left he he didn't make it at notre dame we'll say yeah and he goes and he plays for a year with the milwaukee badgers and then on to the duluth eskimos how did he hook up with those teams well the uh he took uh uh, it started actually with iron, uh, a semi-pro team in Ironwood, Michigan. Somehow uh, they found out in Ironwood. They found out about him in Ironwood, and uh, a couple of players from the Ironwood team came to Minneapolis and asked him to come play for Ironwood. This is 1926 now, and no, I'm sorry, 1925, and uh, and so. So this was the first time he thought, you know, maybe I can make money playing football. Hmm. So he went to play for Ironwood, and somebody from the Milwaukee Badgers spotted him there. Uh, He played, I think, three games with Ironwood, and then the the Badgers signed him. And uh, he played the rest of the season with the Milwaukee Badgers, who were really a pretty bad team. Mm -hmm. That was their last season in Mm -hmm. the NFL, in fact. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, a guy named Ole Hogsrud uh, had bought the Duluth Eskimos for a dollar <laughs> <laughs> because the players were running the team and they just wanted somebody else to run it for them. And so uh, now this was 1926, and this is when the NFL was facing its first real threat uh, because of Red Grange. Uh, Red Grange and his manager, uh, C.C. Cash and Carey Pyle, wanted uh, a New York franchise in uh-huh. the National Football League. Uh-huh. And, of course, uh, the Wellington Mara, the, the owner of the Giants, didn't want any competition. So so they decided, Grange and his manager decided to, to start their own league. This, it was the first American Football League. And they signed a lot of big name players. They signed some of the four horsemen. They signed a, a guy named George Wildcat Wilson from Washington University, who had been the other All American halfback with Grange. And and Pyle claims they had signed Ernie Nevers, who was the second biggest name in football at the time, second only to Red Grange. Now, Ole Hogsrud was up in uh, Duluth. He was from Superior, Wisconsin, originally, which was where never, he'd, he'd been a high school classmate of Ernie Nevers in Superior. And he went down. Nevers was pitching for the St. Louis Cardinals that summer. So Ole Hogsrud went down to St. Louis and found him. And he asked him if he had actually signed with the, the American Football League. And Nevers said, well, I got to... I got an offer from them. I have a contract. I haven't signed it. And I'll play for you if you give me the same amount of money. Hmm. So uh, Hogsford agreed to that. And uh, the amount was 15000 bucks plus a cut of the gate receipts. So, I mean, that was enormous money. At the yeah. Time. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you're buying a team for a buck. I can only imagine <laughs> yeah, how much 15000 right. was. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, uh, but then he he, uh, he knew of Johnny Blood, you know. He he heard of him, so he also he offered a contract to Johnny Blood, and uh, and that, that was an incredible team. I wrote an article for Sports Illustrated about that team. They they played. Uh, 29 games in 110 days. Yeah, I want to ask you about that. So yeah. so, so football or the NFL, it was a totally different setup when oh, yeah. Johnny first played. The yeah. league, you know, teams came and they went. The league was structured so differently. You could play five, six, seven games in eight days. You had teams that called the city home. And they never even played there. They were yeah. they were barnstormers. Oh, yeah. Tell yep. me about those early days of the NFL, or at that time, I guess it was called the American Professional Football Association. Yeah, that's what it was for the first two years of its existence. Yeah, and and they really the league didn't do scheduling in those days. The teams pretty much worked out their own schedules, and. They were always in need of money, so they played a lot of exhibition. Well, I shouldn't say a lot, but uh, but most of the teams did play some exhibition games. So they could know, make more think, money, so the owners could yeah, make exactly. payroll. Yep, yep, exactly. But the Eskimos, I mean, nobody wanted to play in Duluth. It was, you know, it was way up north. It's a long trip. They had a lousy stadium. And it's really uh, cold at this time yes, of year. Yes, exactly, yeah. And... Um, and so they became really a road team. They played one home game, and then they played 28 games on the road. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they, they they left the loose in September, and they didn't get back until February. <laughs> so, wow. Hey, so, and, so how did playing so many games in such a short period of time affect players, especially considering that most of them played on both sides of the ball? How did they oh, yeah. stay healthy? Well... They didn't necessarily. Uh, they they did do a lot of drinking along the way. I'll say that. I don't know if that helped or not. <laughs> but uh, uh, but a lot of the stories were were about you know trying to find the, the, the speakeasy in the in the newest town they were in. So, uh, uh, but and they they had a roster. Well, they they had eighteen guys listed on their roster, but. Uh, often they were down. They had like thirteen or fourteen, you know, because of injury. Or, right, right. So, so let's 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 move this a little bit forward, and, and let's get okay. back to Johnny. So, after he played with Milwaukee and Duluth, he moved on to the Packers. How did he hook up with the Green Bay Packers? Well, actually, between Duluth, he he spent two years in Duluth, and then he spent a year in Pottsville in nineteen twenty eight. Hmm. Uh, Pottsville, Pennsylvania, with a team called the Maroons. And in the last game that Pottsville ever played before folding and leaving the league, they played the Packers. They upset the Packers 26 to 14, and Johnny Blood caught two touchdown passes in that game. And so Curly Lambeau was impressed. And, you know, the, the Packers had had been, had good teams but not quite you know always a little short of, of being a top notch team uh-huh. uh so in 1929 the, the founder and coach of the packers curly lambo decided he really wanted to improve the roster so he signed three guys that were now in the hall of fame uh one was a guard named mike machalski uh the second was a, a tackle a big tackle for especially for the day, named Cal Hubbard, uh, both of whom were already in the NFL. Uh, and um, and then the third guy he signed was Johnny Blood. Now, kind of a funny story there. Uh, John did have a certain reputation, and uh, so Lambeau wanted to sign him. He sent him a telegram and you know asked him to come to Green Bay, sent him the money, the expense money. So John went to Green Bay and went to Lambeau's office and Lambo said, "I'll give you a hundred and ten dollars a game if you promise <laughs> if you promise not to drink from Wednesday through Sunday <laughs> through the game." And John said, "I'll tell you what: give me a hundred dollars a game and let me drink on Wednesday." <laughs> 
so Lambeau was so impressed with his honesty, he said, okay, I'll give you $110 a game, and you can still drink on Wednesday. So, uh, and thus started, so that's, yeah. That's how he got. And that was the first Packers won the next three championships in a row, 29, 30, and 31. And it was, you know, largely because of, of these three guys that uh, Lambeau had just signed. Right. And and just for our listeners who don't know, and I'm sure almost everyone does, Lambeau is the man for whom the stadium is named. What can you tell me about Curly Lambeau? What can you tell us about him? How much he loved the Packers and how he treated his players? Yeah, Lambeau was a very interesting guy. He played one year at Notre Dame under Newt Rockney. And he was the only freshman to win a letter. He, he played fullback mostly and some halfback. Um, he got tonsillectomy before his first year was over, went back to Green Bay, uh, had his tonsils out. And while he was recovering, he was offered a, a, a good paying job um, with a company called the Indian Packing Company, which is a meat packing company. Mm-hmm. And, uh, when fall was coming around, Lambeau really wanted to play football again. So he went to the owner of the packing company and asked him if he would sponsor a team. So uh, the, the guy agreed, and Lambeau put together a team. Now, there had been a team in Green Bay before. A lot of the guys he, he signed, this was uh, 1919, um, were also on, on his first team. But he really turned it into a professional organization uh, as time went on. He, you know, he signed players from Alabama, and from uh, from California, from Gonzaga, which was a pretty big football school at the time. And um, one thing I, I interviewed several of the guys who, pl- who played for Lambeau, and one thing they all agreed on was that he he treated them as first class citizens. They they traveled, you know, and first class on trains they had their own coach uh they were expected to dress well and uh it was really a professional outfit when when that wasn't really that common in pro football you mentioned all these schools the world was a bigger place back then you couldn't you couldn't just hop on a plane and get from point a to point b in yeah, yeah. you know an hour and a half whatever it is how did was it strictly through newspapers? How did you know that the players at these schools that were being written about were really as good as what the articles said? How did you know that the guy from Gonzaga or the guy from UCLA or the guy from Rice University, wherever, how did you know any of those guys were really as good as advertised? Well, you know, that's a really good question. I can't I can't really answer it. I'll, I'll I'll tell you a little story though about the first guy the Packers signed from Gonzaga. Uh, his, his name was Ivan Tiny Cahoon, and of course he was called Tiny because he was very <laughs> big. And uh, and Lambo uh, was at the. This was before they had a draft, you know, the, the college draft. Right. right. And uh, so Lambo was at the the uh, annual league meeting. He, you know, he was the coach, but he was also the owner, or you know, he he represented the team at these meetings. And he heard the owner of the Cardinals, Chris O'Brien, talking about this guy Ivan Cahoon, and he said, "I'm I'm going to sign him." And Lambo beat him to it. <laughs> so, wow. so he signed Tiny Cahoon. Now, some years later. Uh, Tiny Cahoon, who had, had gone back and you know, had retired and gone back to Washington, uh, called Lambeau and he said, uh, there's a real good halfback here at Gonzaga. His name is Tony Canadale. Hmm. So the Packers signed Tony Canadale, who is now in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Hmm. But but uh, a lot of it, as you know, in the late 20s and going to the 30s, a lot of it was old players helping out their old team. Interesting. You know, and recommending guys, yeah. Interesting. Because they didn't have scouts, you know. Right, yeah, that's why, you know, it's, I guess signing somebody without really seeing them uh, was, was a chance you had to take, and that's how the league was established. And, of course, at that time, college football was a much more popular and bigger game than the pros. Oh, yes, much bigger, yeah. So, so having Johnny and Cal Hubbard and Mike Machowski was the catalyst to the first dominant era of Packers football. 
Just how good was that team, and what was Johnny's role? Well, he was really uh, the first great pass receiver in, in pro football. Um, in, interesting thing about that, when I talked to Ole Hogger, John always said bas- he was better at basketball than he was at football. And uh, one thing that Ole Hogsrud told me about John is that he would go up for the ball. When he was covered, he'd go up for the ball like a basketball rebounder. Huh. And he knew... He knew how to, you know, how to protect the ball, how to use his body to protect the ball from a defender. And Ole said he had never seen anybody, uh, any receiver play that way before. He was he was really struck by the way he did it. And um, so that was his big role. Now, they, they played, uh, uh, well, they, the Packers didn't play the single wing. They played the Notre Dame shift. Uh, yeah, Notre and I want to I talk to you about that, too, but just, just finish this up first. Well, he he was a wing back, uh, which was a half back, usually the right half back, who was set just outside the the right end, and so that guy was often uh, he was often used as a blocker, uh, but he was also uh, often the chief pass receiver on a mm-hmm. team, and that that was John's role for most of his NFL career. So, Curly Lambeau played with. Newt Rockney, or he knew Newt Rockney, and he knew the system that Rockney ran at Notre yeah. Dame, the, the the Notre Dame shift. Yep. Explain that system and and how Johnny excelled in that system, a system, a, a system in which he called the plays despite the fact that Lambo once said of Johnny, and I quote. I never figured out how somebody who seemed so erratic could call plays the way he did, but he did it like a master. Johnny yeah. played several positions in that system, and they went on to win the NFL championship. Explain the Notre Dame shift and why Johnny fit it. Well, of course, the, the big uh, the big formation at the time, we're talking 20s and 30s, was the single wing. And the single wing had an unbalanced line because they had, had both guards on, usually on the right side of the center. Um, the Notre Dame system used a balanced line. They would line up essentially in the T formation, and then the backs would shift. The line would remain the same. The backs would shift. So the strength of the formation was based on how the backs were positioned, not on the line. And la- uh, uh, Rockney liked that because it was much harder for the offense. Uh, I'm sorry, the defense to pick up on it, uh, to see exactly who was going where in that backfield mm-hmm. when they shifted, and they they would shift very fast, and and get set and go, you know. And and how did Johnny fit in that? Well, he. Those guys could move around. So in the in the single wing, you pretty your left halfback was your tailback. They were pretty much set. Um, but the other backs were. It was harder to say. So a given guy, say Johnny Blood, might be the tailback on one play and the wing back on the next play and the fullback on the next play. You know. So there was a constant changing of of uh, where the backs were playing. Uh, so that if you're going to throw a pass, for example, you'd have you'd have your best passer uh, as the tailback. If you were going to run the ball, you'd have your best runner as a tailback, typically. Mm-hmm. If you were going to punt it, and they, they often punted, you know, without going into punt formation. They, they did a lot of punting on second and third down. Um, uh, you'd have your best punter at that uh, tailback. Hmm. But, but all those guys could do all three things, typically, wow. or all four things, you know. And they were really they they were a dominant team. They might have been the first true dominant team of the NFL. After the final game of that first season, the Packers boarded a train for the ride home to Green Bay, and I think this might be where the legend of Johnny Blood really kicked into high gear. In fact, after beating the Giants a few weeks earlier, it just, yeah, this might be where that legend took off. There was a party that boxer Primo Canera attended. Yeah. They ran out of ice. 
Somehow he found some. On the train ride home, he ran across the top of the train. Enlighten us about some of Johnny's legendary antics. Yeah. Well, to start with the ice, <laughs> yeah, they uh, they went into New York. They, uh, the Giants were undefeated. The Packers were undefeated. And uh, so this, it, it, it was pretty much set in stone that whoever won this game was going to win the NFL championship. And the Packers actually won it rather easily. They they went twenty one to seven, and Johnny Blood scored the the last touchdown that made it twenty one to seven. And as he he ran around right end, and as he approached the goal line, he held the ball up in the air in his right hand, and he said, "Let's make them like it." <laughs> so, <laughs> so then they had a big party in their hotel, and they you know they had. Uh, uh, they had ice and drinks and so forth, and all sorts of people coming in and out. And uh, Primo Carnera, who was the big, giant, heavyweight boxer, he was something like six foot seven and 250 pounds, was, was happened to be staying in the hotel. Uh, so John saw him, and he, he said, well, he looks like he might be a pretty good football player, and he invited him <laughs> to come up to the party. And so at some point early in the morning, they ran out of ice. And uh, John looked out the, the window and, and he saw an ice wagon, you know, going around making early deliveries to the bars and stuff. So so he took the elevator down, went running out, caught up to the ice truck and told the guy he wanted some ice. And the guy said, well, how much do you want? And John said, oh, give me a 75-pound block. But he had nothing to so, carry it with. No, no, of course not. So he just did a, took this seventy pound, seventy five pound block of ice, put it on his shoulder, carried it back to the hotel, and got in the elevator with some other people who were, you know, wondering who who is this crazy guy, you know. And uh, he managed to, you know, with a numb shoulder, he finally got back to the hotel room and dumped it into the uh, the bathtub. But he was cheered as the hero for this he had saved the party he, he liked to he liked to have fun you know oh he, yeah. yeah he he had a great career and why do you suppose a guy like johnny blood mcnally is not very well known with all of the antics he pulled how valuable he was to the packers his ability on the field how come we know guys like red grange newt rockney Ernie Nevers, Bronco Nagurski, and not Johnny Blood, especially with such a nickname. Now, I recently did a podcast on the quarterback of the Cleveland Browns, Frank Ryan. He was the last oh, yeah. guy to win an NFL title for the Browns, and he did it in 1964. And I was yeah. speaking with, with an author, a guy by the name of Roger Gordon, who has written so much about the Cleveland Browns. And I asked him, I said, how come you don't think people remember Frank Ryan? He said, his name. It's a, it's a vanilla name. It's yeah. not Johnny Unitas, Joe yeah, Namath, right. yeah. Y.A. Tittle. We're talking about Johnny Blood, the name Blood. I mean, that's a name. That's a name you wouldn't forget. Why do you think we're just not as familiar with him as those other guys? Yeah, that's that's a very, you know, coming from Green Bay, uh, that's not true in Green Bay at all. Right, although sure. I'm, certainly I'm sure. it is outside Green Bay. And I really don't know. I, I, I wish I did. You know, if, if people knew the name more, I'd, I'd sell more copies of my book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I will tell you something, Warren. Uh, I guess it was about three or four years ago, uh, Green Bay or some people in Green Bay set up something called the Packer Heritage Trail, which, uh, you know, goes to various sites of interest that have to do with the Packers. And it starts downtown at a place called the the, uh, the Packer Heritage Trail Plaza. Mm -hmm. They have statues of four players there. Now, there, I can't remember how many Packers there are in the Hall of Fame, but it's it's a lot. But they picked four guys to, to have statues of life-size statues. And those four guys are Clark Hinkle, Bart Starr, Paul Hornung, and Johnny Blood. 
So in Green so Bay, he is a big that's deal. That's the kind of esteem he's he's held in in Green Bay, you know. Right. And uh, but unfortunately, you know, as you said, not outside. And I really I can't say why. Especially with that name, it's just it, it it strikes me. Okay, the Packers win three straight NFL championships: 1929, 1930, 1931, and they're getting ready for the 1932 season. And Johnny Blood needs to get to Green Bay for camp. He doesn't yeah. have enough money. This guy somehow, some way, <laughs> just doesn't have enough money. And this is yeah. where and when the name Vagabond Halfback was hatched. Explain. Yeah, he, well, John was an experienced, uh, how sh- shall I say, hobo is not quite the right word. <laughs> but he knew, he knew how to ride trains without buying a ticket, if I, you know, and that might be a good way of putting it. And he kind of started doing that as a kid, just fooling around in, in uh, his hometown of New Richmond, Wisconsin. But he did a lot of it in the course of his life. So now he lived in New Richmond, which is across the state. It's in the western part of the state, almost in Minnesota from Green Bay. And uh, to get to training camp in 1932, he had to take the train. But as you said, he didn't have money for a ticket. So he 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 went to and he had to change trains along the way. So he went to the train station in New Richmond, Wisconsin, and he he had just enough money to send a telegram uh, ahead to I, I believe it was a little town called Amherst Junction, and he said uh, uh, we have a passenger. Uh, coming from New Richmond who needs to connect to the train uh, uh, to Green Bay. So please hold the train for him because there was like a five-minute difference or something like that. So he then proceeded to to hop on the train with paying and and rode to Amherst Junction. And he jumped off his train there. The train to Green Bay was waiting, and he um, he hopped in, into what they call the blind baggage, which was a place hobos used to ride. <laughs> And the train waited for a while, and this passenger hadn't shown up. So uh, so the train started on its way to Green Bay, and somewhere along the line, the brakeman came through and, and said, aren't you Johnny Blood? And uh, John said, yeah, I am. And the guy said, are you the passenger that we held the train for? And John said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and the trainman said, well, this is the first time we ever held a train for a hobo. <laughs> <laughs> So then when they got to Green Bay and, you know, he reported for practice and so forth, there was a sports writer there from the Milwaukee Journal, guy named Oliver Ollie Keekley, and John told Keekley this story. And Keekley said, well, I'm going to write a column about that. I'm going to call you the hobo halfback. And Curly Lambeau was standing nearby and he overheard him and he said, look, I don't want any of my players being called a hobo. So Keekley did write the call on column, but he called him the Vagabond Halfback, and that, that was a nickname that stuck with him. So, And the name of your book. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So he makes it, he finally gets there uh, on his train ride, and they embark on the 1932 season. Now, earlier we discussed about how different the NFL was. As you said, mm-hmm. The NFL didn't make the schedule. The teams right. scheduled the games, and uh, we could do a whole show on on how all of that worked or didn't work. Yeah. But yeah. but they yeah. the so the thirty two season, if that if the league had decided a champion by the way the NFL standings work today, the Packers would have won four straight championships because they would have added a championship in 1932. That's right. Um, But at that time, ties didn't count. So it was basically your winning percentage. So even though the Packers went 10 and two, actually 10, two and one, they finished third behind two teams who had significantly less wins. They finished third behind Portsmouth, Portsmouth, which went 6-1-1, one, and one, and Chicago, the Bears, not the Cardinals, which went 5-1-6. and six. The Packers and Johnny Blood 
were not thrilled with that result. Tell me about that season, Johnny's year, and the bitter disappointment of finishing third when they had significantly more wins than the two teams who finished ahead of them. Yeah, well, it it looked, you know, everybody thought for most of the season the Packers are going to win this championship. There's no contest. I mean, they were piling up victories, and uh, and uh, the Bears and Portsmouth were piling up a lot of ties. But suddenly, when they looked at the standings near the end of the season, and, and they had uh, a game coming up against the Bears in Chicago, they realized that the, that. <laughs> they were. If they beat the Bears, Portsmouth was going to win the championship, and if they lost to the Bears, it was going to be a tie wow. between Chicago and Portsmouth. Even though those two teams combined only had, I think, ten or eleven victories. Eleven wins combined, and Green Bay had ten. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so they they ended up losing that game, and and that led to the first uh, championship playoff game between the Bears and Portsmouth. Right. So so they actually played for the championship, like you said, the first time ever the NFL the NFL staged a championship game, and because of the weather, that game was actually played indoors at Chicago yep. Stadium. Yep. Now that game had a lasting effect on the rules of football. What were some of the rules that were adopted for that one game that were ultimately adopted by the NFL, including splitting the league into two divisions so a championship could be played every year? Yeah, well, the Chicago Stadium wasn't big enough to hold a a, a full-size football field. And, you know, it's rather oddly shaped. Um, it, it's basically a hockey rink, you know, so, uh, so they, they laid, I, I can't remember the exact dimensions. I, I believe the field that they laid out was 80 feet or 80 yards long from end line to end line, which would ordinarily be 120 yards. And, um, because the sidelines were so close to the barriers around the field, um, they decided that they would uh, they would bring the ball in like ten yards or whatever it was from the sideline. Now at that time in football, if the ball went out of bounds, it was put in play right next to the sideline, and a team basically had to waste a play just getting the ball closer to the center of the field. Hmm. Uh, but for this game, they if the ball went out of bounds, they brought it in. I can't remember what the distance was, but they brought it in, you know, 10 yards or whatever it was, which allowed a team to you know, to run actually a play from their playbook. And um, uh, that, that, another... that, that move sort of led to hash marks, didn't it? Exactly, yes. Uh, and the following season, the, the uh, NFL adopted the, the hash marks and they brought the ball in on to the hash mark, the nearest hash mark, any time it went out of bounds. Uh, another rule was that a, a forward pass, uh, the, the passer had to be at least five yards behind the line of scrimmage. And uh, in that championship game, the, the Bears' great Bronco Nagurski, uh, uh, the, pa- the Bears were down, I think, on the two-yard line or something like that, and they they had tried running Nagurski, and he'd been stopped cold. And on the next play, they ran Nagurski again. But as he approached the line of scrimmage, he threw a jump pass to Red Grange, who was standing all alone in the end zone. And Portsmouth argued that uh, that he had had not been five yards behind the line of scrimmage, but the officials didn't ignore uh, ignored that. So at the league meeting the following year, they got rid of that rule. Uh, that, that the passer had to be five yards back, hmm. and um, I think I think there was one other big rule change that came out of that, but I, I, it doesn't come to mind right now. But they also at that well, I meeting, think I think that had something to do with the goalpost, did it not? Yes, you're right. The the goalpost had been uh, back on the end line, but for that game, they didn't. The the end zones were kind of curved in shape. 
and uh, so for that game, they put the goal the, the, the goalposts on the goal line, and and they left them there. They, you know, they changed the rule again to put the goalposts on the goal line. That's right. You're right. So in a way, in a way, in a cruel way, it's sort of a good thing that Green Bay didn't win the championship that year because who knows what the rules would be today, right? The yeah, rules? That, that's a very good point, Warren. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> this was also around the time that um, Curly and Johnny, um, they sort of had this love-hate relationship. Yeah. And this was like the beginning of the end although he did play a little more with Green Bay, but this was also around the beginning of the end of Johnny's time with the Packers. Talk about the the, the love-hate relationship between he and Curly Lambeau. Well, the fans really loved Johnny Blood. And, you know, for obvious reasons, he was a great player. He was a fun guy. He, he said to me at one, uh, during our interviews, he said, uh, I, I probably had a, at least one drink with everybody in Green Bay at one time or another, so they all knew me. <laughs> and, uh, and and Lambo was a, a very egotistical guy, which eventually led to his his end as a, the coach of the Packers. And he really didn't appreciate that. He you know he felt that he was the Packers and that you know uh, the fans shouldn't like any player more than they liked him. So. Um, so they, you know, he, he liked John as a player, obviously, because he helped them win games. But in 1933, the Packers had, had a bad season. They had the, the, their first losing season in their history. And, um, and John was cut. Well, Lambo had to save some money. Um, so he cut John toward the end of the season. And, um, uh, John went off. He played for a pro foot, uh, semi-pro team uh, for a couple of games, and then Lambo brought him back so that he could trade him, and he traded him to uh, the team that was then known as the Pittsburgh Pirates, now the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right. Uh, however, John did return for for uh, another championship season, in 1936. Right. So so he left Green Bay, goes to a semi-pro team. Ends up back with Green Bay because Curly signs him back so he could trade him. He trades him to the Pittsburgh Pirates, which later become the Pittsburgh Steelers. Many teams back then used the namesake of the use the name of the associated baseball team in town for uh, notoriety. Well, with the New York Giants. Yeah. Right, right. But, you know, his relationship, like we said, with Lambeau just wasn't great. And ultimately, he wound up with Pittsburgh again, this time as a player coach. Right. How did he wind up with Pittsburgh? And what were his years like in Pittsburgh? He wasn't there for a long time. He resigned as a coach, and he was sort of tired of Art Rooney's antics. What was it like to be with Pittsburgh back then, and what was Rooney like? Well, he, uh, according to, see, Rooney was very well known as a, you know, very devout Irish Catholic guy. And he, he saw Johnny Blood, you know, as another Irish Catholic guy. And, and he liked having them on the team. But John just didn't fit that mold at all. And um, so he, he spent one season with Pittsburgh, 1934, and then went back to the Packers, where he, he and Don Hudson formed quite a, potent receiving combination. Another Hall of Famer? Yep. And, uh, but then he and Lambeau really just didn't get along at all. And, and uh, John decided he had to go somewhere else. And Rooney offered him the job. You know, he wanted him to come back to Pittsburgh as player coach. Um, so John went back in 1937 as player coach. And he kept, uh, he kept thinking they had a pretty good team. Uh, had some pretty good players, and they usually started out pretty well. But, of course, Rooney was a big horse player. And, um, oh, I, I should say one of the players that they had was uh, a guy known as Wizard White at the time, later became Supreme Court Justice Byron R. White. Right. And, uh, uh, and Rooney had signed him to a contract for like $15,000, which was, again, unheard of. 
it was like uh, three times as much as John was getting to be a player coach. <laughs> uh, so, and Rooney was a horse player, and he scheduled a lot of exhibition games so that uh, he could pay Wizard White's salary. So, uh, and he was having a bad streak at the track, so he kept selling players. He, you know, he'd lose some money at the track and he'd sell a player. And uh, he, in the in the course of the season, actually within the course of two or three weeks, he sold the whole starting backfield except Wizard White. Wow. And John was was pretty much a role player at this point, but he found himself, you know, he he was typically a right halfback, sometimes left halfback. He found himself playing quarterback, or he he had to play quarterback because he didn't have anybody else who could play the <laughs> position. And he played one full game as a fullback, which he had never played in his life. But again, they, they didn't have another fullback. So, uh, so the team was kind of hurt by that, that kind of stuff, you know, by playing all those extra games. And, and uh, he didn't have a, a good record at all, as it turned out. He, he ended up quitting uh, about the middle of the 1939 season, which would have been his third season there. And that was the end of his NFL career. Right, and he bounced. He 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 bounced around a little afterwards, or he bounced around a lot afterwards. He enlisted in yep. the service, played a little more football, but ultimately became a professor at St. John's. Uh, that's St. John's in Minnesota. What was his life like after his playing days were over? There were alumni games. He tried to get Wizard White elected president. He got yeah. married for a second time. He went to school. He coached at St. John's. And he was a pretty smart guy like we talked about earlier. In fact, he liked economics a lot, so much so he had a theory. He said people should spend themselves rich and not That's save right. themselves poor. What did that mean? And what were his theories on economics? And didn't he once check himself into a hospital to dry out and write a book on economics? Man, I just asked you a lot of questions. What was his life like after his playing days were over? Well, he he was very much a vagabond. Still, he, he did uh, you know he did a lot of stuff. He moved around a lot. He uh, he used to go to San Francisco every year. He'd he'd become friendly with a guy named Shandy Malone who owned a bar in San Francisco. He'd go out to. San Francisco and, and uh, spend a couple of months there, work as a bartender in Shandy Malone's saloon. Uh, he worked as a feed salesman for his father's former company, Domain Enterprises of New Richmond. Uh, he spent one year on Guam uh, reading books. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what else did he do along the way? And then his, his ele he tried to get Wizard White elected president oh yes yeah 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 and i was part of that because he was doing that um at the time that we were working on the book together uh so i wrote some some stuff for him just as a favor you know, wow but he uh he decided this this would have been 1972 um and he, he decided that nixon shouldn't be president and that uh the Democrats didn't have a viable candidate, but here was Wizard White, you know, who was a Supreme Court justice, and um, and so he started a movement to to draft Wizard White for for president, and of course White couldn't have anything to do with it as you know as a justice of the Supreme Court, he had to mm -hmm. stay out of mm -hmm. and stuff. So so John just traveled all over promoting this idea. He had stuff printed up, and he got interviews. Uh, just all over the country, and, but the trouble was the the interviews were uh, they were all about Johnny Blood the football player and not about <laughs> Wizard White the presidential candidate. So nothing came of it. You know he was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in the inaugural class of 1963 with such legends as Sammy Baugh and Red Grange, George Hallis, Bronco Nagurski, Jim Thorpe, and a, and a few others. There were 17. But I don't think it's a stretch to say that Johnny Blood McNally is the least known of the bunch, as we talked about earlier as well. What should yeah. we remember about Johnny Blood? Well, I, 
I kind of he was born in 1903, November 1903, and he and he said to me, I think that's significant because that was the beginning of the air age with the Wright brothers, and and I was part of the the first really great passing team in the National Football League, and and I think that that's how I think of him, and that's how uh, you know based on what I heard. He, his pass receiving abilities were astounding. In yeah, fact, that, in, in, in in thirty one, he scored fourteen touchdowns and eleven were via the pass. Yeah, I mean the guy just he was different than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, and that, by the way, that's still it's an unofficial record because the NFL didn't start keeping official records until nineteen thirty two. Uh, but that is the record for the most touchdown receptions by a back, by a halfback. By, even, by today, halfback. even today, even yes. today. Yep, yep. Wow. Still a record. Wow. And in fact, that was the NFL record until Don Hudson in 1942. Wow. Hey, Ralph, um, I'd love to continue our conversation. We've been on for quite some time. We got to get, uh, we got to wrap this up. I'd okay. love for you to tell us where fans of Sports Forgotten Heroes, where fans of Johnny Blood, the Green Bay Packers, the NFL, where can they get a copy of your book? Well, basically, it's it's an Amazon book. I, I published it through Create Space, which is an Amazon uh, subsidiary or something, and uh, it's uh, so it's available on the Amazon website. And uh, my name is Ralph Hickok, and the the book is Vagabond Halfback, the Saga of Johnny Blood McNally, and it's a. May I? Can I say something about the front cover here? Absolutely. There's there's a portrait of Johnny Blood on the front cover. This portrait was done by a childhood friend of mine named John Gordon. John and I lived next door to one another when we were kids and Packer fans. Uh, John grew up to be quite an artist. And he designed the Packer logo for Vince Lombardi back in 1961. Wow. He's now been officially recognized as, as the creator of the Packer logo. I, I was there, uh, and uh, John and his wife and, and uh, my wife and I went to uh, dinner at uh, or for lunch at Lambeau Field, and we went to the Packer Hall of Fame, and there's a little exhibit there about how the Packer logo came to be. Very cool. And so when I did the book, I asked John if he would do a front cover illustration for me, and he very kindly did it. So. That's very cool. Well, yeah. you know, it's a terrific book. And it, there's also, uh, you know, there's just so much more than, than what we spoke about. It's even a, uh, a good geography lesson for, for <laughs> those, of, those of us who've never visited the, the, the northern reaches of, of that portion of the country. Ralph, thank you so much for being here on Sports Forgotten Heroes. I really enjoyed our conversation. I, I enjoyed it a lot too, Warren. Thanks for having me as a guest. Absolutely. Welcome. Anytime. Over the course of his career, Johnny Blood played for Milwaukee, Duluth, Pottsville, Green Bay, and Pittsburgh. Of course, the game was much different than from what it is today. Schedules were made by the teams rather than the league. Teams played an uneven amount of games. And there were many exhibition games along the way. There's no true accounting of his overall career numbers. But what has been recorded includes 37 touchdown receptions, five rushing touchdowns, and five interceptions returned for touchdowns. And of course, 14 touchdown receptions in one season as a halfback is still a record. He was a threat any time the ball touched his hands. Fans of the Green Bay Packers honored Johnny with a statue outside Lambeau Field. And away from the field, he led as colorful a life as anyone. For more information on Johnny Blood, please visit sportsfh.com for links to articles and more. To read more about Johnny, head on over to Amazon to get Ralph's book about Johnny called Vagabond Halfback, The Saga of Johnny Blood McNally. Next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we'll take a look back at a man who played in two sports and was absolutely dynamite on the hardwood, Dave DeBusher. But while most might remember what he did for the New York Knicks, 
you remember the fact that he was named the coach of the Detroit Pistons at the incredibly young age of 24. And fewer remember his forgotten career with the Chicago White Sox. Yep, next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes, the forgotten baseball career of Dave DeBusher. Thanks again to today's guest, Ralph Hickok, and we'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.